Today we're going to be tackling one of my favorite models of all time. Don't go away. Hello everybody and welcome to Fat Guy Productions. I am Paul coming to you as always from beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. And today we're going to be doing one of my all-time favorite models ever. Now, if you know anything about me, you know that my number one all-time favorite model was the iconic design from Tom Daniel, the Tarantula. And the reason for that is it was the first model I ever saw. And it exposed me to the hobby. Now, it's not the first model I ever built. It's just the first model I ever saw. A friend gave me a a built version of it and I loved it and it made me aware so ever since then I've been in love with models and especially with Tom Daniel designed uh, model kits from you know my youth well with that in mind if you look at all of Tom Daniel's designs Tom Daniel okay I don't know how you would say that okay his name is Tom Daniel how would you say like his possession. I don't know. Somebody help me out. Put it in the comments. So, so if you look at Tom Daniel design models and go through his whole catalog, and it's extensive, and I were to pick a number two spot right up there as a potential number two would be this kit, Rommel's Rod. Now, we started this model a long time ago, about a year ago, and I never finished it. I got uh, you know, bumped around with a bunch of different stuff. Just didn't get it done. Well, I've got it done now, so let's go and get to work. So, as I said, today we're going to be tackling the Tom Daniel iconic design, Rommel's Rod. This one is going to be a lot of fun. Even though this is a very simplistic kit, I'm going to start out the same way I do with every model I build. I'm going to open it up, do a quick inventory of everything in the box, just so I'm familiar with what's going on. Then I'm going to give a thorough review to the instructions. And then I'm going to develop my own build plan. A lot of people like to paint all of their parts in advance on the sprues. I'm not in that camp. I like to build as many sub-assemblies as possible and paint them as a whole. Building models this way means that I have to have a good solid plan. I don't want to overbuild so that later I have problems putting things together. As I said, it is a very simplistic kit. I think the entire motor has uh, like six parts to it. Very, very simplified. But that doesn't handcuff you from doing a lot of fun things with this kit. It's up to you, your imagination, and your vision of what you want the kit to come out like. The instructions are vital. I don't care how experienced you are, always understand the instructions, even if you plan to not follow them, like I'm not going to. I still want to know how this thing is supposed to go together so I don't run into any snags. For some reason or another, most model vehicles begin with building the engine, and that's no exception here. As I said, it's very simplified, not a lot of parts, so using the instructions, I'll go through, get all the parts out, cut them from the sprue using my side cutters. By the way, these are the Tamiya side cutters, and I just love these things. I don't know what I would do without them. Highly, highly recommended. Anyhow, I get all the parts cut out, laid out, 
Then I break out my X-Acto knife. I remove any bits of the sprue. I remove any flash and clean everything up before assembly. I say this a lot, and I'm going to say it again. Good habits are habits that last a lifetime. So get into good habits even with simple models like this. Start by getting all your parts cleaned up, test fit everything, make sure you fully understand what you're doing before you break out the glue. Once you have that figured out, you can break out your cement and start putting parts together. There is a chrome sprue in here. After all, this is not a legit military armor model. This is a, a fantasy custom rod, okay? So there is chrome. I can tell you, half the chrome is going to be stripped off using Super Clean, and the chrome I am leaving behind is going to get uh, a little bit of a treatment to make it not look so nice and shiny. So I know this will sound counterintuitive, but keep a nice, fresh, sharp blade in your razor knife. This will keep you from hurting yourself. Now I know you're thinking to yourself, sharp blade means I'm going to stab myself. But trust me, having a sharp, clean blade in there is the way to go. Don't ask me how I know, just trust me on this one. Keep a good blade in your knives. With all the parts cleaned up, test fit, I can now use a little bit of Tamiya thin cement and I'll just apply it to the seam between the parts while applying moderate pressure with my free hand. This will allow the plastic to dissolve and blend together so that when it hardens, it almost becomes like one piece. Once the parts are cemented together, I can go back over them one final time and make sure that the seams are completely filled. If the melted plastic didn't fill the seam, I can use a little bit of putty, and then I can take my razor knife, do a little scraping, I can use a sanding stick, or whatever I need to make sure that the seams are gone. One very simplified area of this model is the engine compartment. As I said, the motor itself doesn't have a lot of parts, and in fact the firewall is just completely devoid of any detail whatsoever. So, if it's your thing, you can do a lot of scratch build here. I'm not going to. Yes, I'm going to do a little paint detail and make the motor look nice, but 
it's never going to be on display, so I don't really need to get carried away here. Here you can see just how simplified this kit is. The body and the frame and all of these pieces are just big old giant pieces of plastic. Not a lot of assembly involved here. Slap them together, you're good to go. Now my plan here with Rommel's Rod is to bring to the table some advanced armor detailing techniques and give this a, a kind of a realistic armor look even though it's a fantasy car. Now I'm not going to do a bunch of scratch building and stuff so it's almost kind of like a marriage between a fantasy car and some real armor. That's my plan here. When doing armor one of the nice things is you don't have to do a lot of pre-painting. These things got quick down and dirty paint jobs and so all I have to do is really just build this thing up and paint it as a whole. It really doesn't matter when you're talking about military armor. The motor is assembled and set aside to dry and I'm wrapping up all the work on the body. I've got the interior in. I'm putting the frame on. I'm putting the windshield frames on and really just getting as much on here as possible so when I paint it, I can paint it all in one pass. So by using Tamiya Extra Thin Cement and gently squeezing the parts together as I apply the cement, like I said, you can fill a lot of minor gaps between the parts, but the gaps always need a little attention after the fact. Here I am just sanding down one of the seams on the spare tire cover. With the lion's share of the assembly done, I can now go and put down my first layer of paint. For the base coat, I'm going to use German Grey. During the war, a lot of the stuff that was used in Europe, when it was moved over to Africa and the Africa Corps, it was already German Grey, and they just slapped a coat of tan paint over the top of it and called it good. That's exactly what I'm going to do here. Painting armor might be the easiest paint job you'll ever do in model building as far as just basic coloring goes. Now there's going to be a lot more to this, but it really is nice to just be able to go around and throw the paint down and get this thing colored. So once I'm done getting this color down, I'm going to coat the model with two coats of Vallejo chipping fluid. This will allow me to give the vehicle a really nice, weathered, realistic look. Now, if you don't have chipping fluid, you don't need to stress about it. There are other techniques you can use with stuff that you probably have in your house. Hairspray, salt, they both work really well for doing chipping. But I have chipping fluid, so I'm going to use it. Now don't just think that chipping fluid is super easy, that you just throw it on, paint over it, and rub it off. There is a lot of variables going on here. What paints are you using? How heavy of a coat did you put on in the chipping fluid? How long did you let it dry before putting a paint coat over the top of it? 
How long did you let that dry before you tried to take some of it off? But with a little practice, you'd be amazed at the uh, realistic look that you can get by using a chipping fluid. So I've got the chipping fluid down and now I'm just painting this with a plain old sand color. In the military modeling community, there's always a ton of discussion about what is the right color for my Sherman? What is the right color for my Tiger? What is the right color for my Spitfire? Well, I got news for you. It doesn't matter. Okay, these guys were not sticking to some detailed color palette. They were given a rough color, they were slapping paint together and throwing it on these vehicles, and it really didn't matter. If you took every Sherman from the war and lined them all up in a row, you'd be hard pressed to find two that were the same color. So pick a color, put it down, and don't stress about it. Oh yeah, and I, I realize I probably have armor guys rolling over in their graves right now, but they'll get over it. So I have my base coat on, I have a couple coats of chipping fluid on, I have my color coat on, and now I'm just using a damp brush and rubbing off some of the top layer of paint to expose the bottom layer. And this is all made possible by the chipping fluid. Man, I'll tell you what, you need a weathered vehicle, a vehicle that looks like it's been in service, this is the way to go and you're going to get some amazing realistic results. Certainly different vehicles and different uses and different ages are going to impact how much or how little you chip. But I would recommend to use a light hand. If you take too much off there's really not any way to go backwards from that short of redoing the entire thing. So go lightly, don't overdo it. You know, any effect that you do, you can overdo it and ruin your project. So have a light hand here. With all of the chipping done, I want to get my decals on now. And the reason for that is I want to sand down some of the decals. I want to chip some of the decals. I want to put some of the weathering over the decals. I want those decals to be as weathered and blend into the model as the rest of it is. So I really want to get those on now so that they get the full effect of everything else that I'm going to do here. I have to say here, these decals are awesome, okay? And the reason I say that is the, the coating over the top of them is just where the decal is. There is no edge that you're gonna have to deal with where you might get silvering and stuff. So it's really not a big issue here. You can cut these out, stick them on, and they work great. With the decals on and thoroughly dry, I can now use little different things to weather them. I'm using some sanding sponges, some higher grit sandpaper, I'm using the edge of my X-Acto knife, whatever I have on hand to distress these decals and make them blend in with the body. Once I'm happy with the decals, I'm gonna throw matte varnish over the entire model to seal the decals in and protect all the work I've done thus far. You might have noticed that the motor was never completely finished and that's because I had some parts that had chrome on them 
and I didn't want it. So I just dropped them into this little vat of super clean. A little while later, all the chrome was off. I'm able to take the parts, wash them, paint them the way I want them, and then glue them down onto the model. There are so many opportunities under the hood for detailing. You could just go hog wild under here. Well, I didn't want to do that. That wasn't the goal of my build. So I'm going to detail what's here using paints and weathering powders and panel liners and things like that. But I'm not going to do a bunch of scratch building here. I'm going to start out by just putting a little bit of Tamiya panel liner, black panel liner, all over the motor to give it a, a realistic, worn, used look. I did have some chipping fluid on it, and I chipped the motor a little bit as well. So between those two things, the motor is really starting to come to life. Later, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to use a little bit of brown uh, panel liner, and I'm also going to use some engine oil grime and things like that. And the motor's going to look really, really nice. I'm just not going to go hog wild with the detail. As long as I have the panel liners out, I'm going to go ahead and go around the rest of the vehicle, and I'm going to put them in seams around uh, doors and panels and things like that to give a little bit more pop to the model and make it look a little bit more realistic. I'll be using both Tamiya Black and Tamiya Brown panel liner for this. So now I'm going to be using an oil brusher by MIG. I've got a rust-colored oil brusher, and I'm going around and I'm putting very sparse, because remember, this is a desert vehicle, but I'm going to put little rust dots in some of the, the places where you would expect liquids to pool and rust to happen. And then later, after it dries, I'll kind of blend it in with a damp brush and just smooth it out just to give the hint of rust. We all have our wheelhouse and mine is doing exhaust manifolds. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use my oil brusher in the rust color and I'm going to paint it all over the exhaust manifold. Then by using some track rust pigment powder, also made by MIG. I'm going to just dab that on all over this fresh oil paint, and that's going to give it that dried, crusty, crumbly look that exhaust manifolds have. And let me tell you something, it looks so real. So base coat of rust colored oil brusher, then track rust pigment powders, and man, let me tell you, you will nail exhaust manifolds. So I'm just using a nice soft brush. I've dampened it in turpenoid, removed most of it on a paper towel, and I'm now using that to blend in the rust from the oil brushers and just kind of streak it and make it look really mild, but just enough that you see that it's there and understand that there's a little bit of rust happening. Have an issue, like I have here, where I had a little too much of the oil brusher on here? 
All you gotta do is take a cotton bud, dampen it in the terpenoid, and you can remove almost all of it like it never happened, and then you can go back and redo it until you get it the way you want it. If you watch Flying Valiant's builds, and if you're not, you should be, because he's amazing. You'll see him constantly using these AK Interactive weathering pencils. So I liked what I saw, and I ordered a bunch of them, and I tried them out here for the very first time, and I got to tell you, I really love them. If you moisten the pencil, it applies almost like a very thin paint. But you don't have to do it that way. You can just kind of rub it across the edge of something and get a little bit of that color going there. And I really liked them. I found that the uh, chipping color and the dark rust color were my favorite. I felt they were the most realistic. And it really enhanced the thing that I was going for here. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really digging these. Thank you for the great tip, Flying Valiant. And like I said, if you're not watching him, look him up on YouTube. He does some great stuff. Simple? I will give you simple. Look at this. The bogies and the tracks are all one giant molded piece. Talk about simplified. Hey, as a kid, who wants to try and put tracks together? Nobody, okay? So I get it. I'm just saying this model doesn't have a lot of detail. So to make these tracks really sing, you're going to have to do a lot of work with your paintbrush. The tracks as a whole got the exact same paint job and chipping and everything else that the rest of the model got. Once they're sealed, now I'm coming back and I'm just using some flat black paint to paint the tracks themselves. And then I'm going to use some panel liner to fill in some gaps and also to try and make the holes in the bogies look like they're actually holes rather than just molded solid pieces. Variety here is the spice of life. So you'll notice my bogies all have a little bit of a different look to them. Some are a little bit metallic-y, some are a little rusty, some have oil leaks on them, some are a dark color, some are a light color. Because let me tell you, if you blew a bogey in the field, they threw whatever they had on there. And they didn't really care what it looked like. This was a war vehicle. So... Feel free to add a little variety, and it will add a lot of realism to your build. So, I still have more work to do on the tracks, but for now, we're going to put them to the side, let them thoroughly dry, and I can turn my attention to the front tires. So, the front tires are rubber. And they're too shiny and too black and unrealistic looking. So I'm going to glue in the wheels from both sides, glue them in, and then I'm going to paint the rubber with Tamiya XF69, which is NATO black. This is such a perfect color for painting all of your tires on all your vehicles. It's a far more realistic dark gray than just a pure black like these tires are right here. So... I'll just paint those up and then I can weather them along with the rest of the model. The tracks are dry. So I'm going to use a little bit of gunmetal weathering powder and I'm just going to brush it onto the tracks to give them an added dimension. This way they're not just flat black, they have a little bit of a metallic sheen on the high edges and that's going to give them a much more realistic look.
Again, if I was trying to do a super realistic, detailed piece of military armor, I would probably be adding rust and some other colors and things like that. But that's not what I'm going for here. I just want them to look, well, I guess realistic, but not over realistic, if that makes any sense at all. So you can see here I have glued on the front wheels, I've glued on the tracks, and this thing is really starting to take shape here. I'm feeling very good about where I'm at. Now it's time for a lot of the detail parts. On the back of the vehicle there are some track pieces so that if the vehicle were to blow a piece of track they could repair it in the field. You've got two machine guns, you've got ammo cases, you've got a map table and a lot of other things. There are two things here that are a lot of fun and depending on how you're going to do your build you may or may not want to use them. For me I'm going to skip them for now and that is the skeleton figures that go inside of this vehicle. You have Rommel himself in the back and his driver up in front. But it just kind of doesn't fit in with the look that I'm doing. So this time around, I'm leaving the skeletons out, at least for now. With a basic paint job on all of the accessory pieces, I can start to do a little bit of detailing. For example, on the machine guns, I'm using more of that gun metal and just brushing it over the guns. This will bring out the highlights and give a metallic look to the guns and make them really look very realistic and make them pop. I can now put in the steering wheel, the shifter knob, the little hand grenades, and all the other little accessories that are going to make this thing really fun. So the kit comes with a couple of pennant holders and little Nazi flags that go on the fenders. And I opted not to use those for a couple reasons. First of all, the, the stanchions for the flags, they, they seem disproportionately thick. So I'm going to replace those with a couple of pieces of piano wire. Cut them to the same length, glue them in place, and I'm not going to have any flags on them because, hey, I doubt that the flags would have held up over the, the years. They probably wouldn't be there, so I'm not going to put them on. If I ever do, I'll probably put like tattered flags that are just hanging loose. But for right now, I'm just going to have the stanchions up there and no flags at all. With the last few details painted, weathered, and added to the vehicle, I can now call this one done. It was as much fun as I thought it would be, and I really hope you guys love this build. Well, there you have it, my Tom Daniel-designed Rommel's Rod. 
Uh, I definitely took this in a different direction and I brought to, to it a lot of uh, advanced armor detailing techniques and things like that and, and made this a little bit different than you might expect it to be. And you notice I didn't even put the skeletons in because I, I felt like that took away from the, the concept of the build that I was going for here. In the end, I think it came out really, really awesome. It was a super fun model to build, and I hope you really love this video. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up, click subscribe, and don't forget to click the notification bell so you never miss one of my model builds. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. Just remember, if you carry your childhood with you, you'll never grow old. Until next time, this is Paul from Fat Guy Productions saying be good.